the chairs that move. This one move. Yeah. Look at the record. Could you tell us your name and who you're representing? My name is Katie Ballard, and I am here as a parent, and I am here for um, Disability Rights Coalition. I first want to start by saying thank you to the committee for giving us the opportunity to speak with you on Disability Awareness Day. As a person living with a disability, as a parent of two children with disabilities, the importance of Disability Awareness Day is big in our family, so having this opportunity today really means a lot. Um, I'll be honest. Most of my uh, previous testimony experience had to do with specific bill or subject, so not having one is a little bit uh, harder. So please, if there are questions, don't hesitate to ask, because I know sometimes I can jump around. I am the parent of two children on IEPs in the Essex Westford School District. Um, I have three children who attend school there. We started in the Essex Town School District prior to the merger. And after being homeless for a number of years, we were able to secure an affordable apartment in the junction. Now, given that the school has merged, we were lucky enough to be able to continue our older two children in the school in the town. And my youngest now attends in what used to be the junction. So I've had experience with both um, different systems a little bit and the way that they navigate special education specifically. I think there are a lot of different opinions and discussions about special education and parents' role in special education. And I think one of the things I'd really like to talk about with you today has been some of the really positive experiences that have come from my ability to be a active and engaged member of my children's IEP teams and how that's benefited their education as well as our home life and allowed me to continue to grow and to actually get back to work um, full time as a person with a disability um, and still parent two children um, on IEPs that have intense levels of meetings at times. I'd also like to speak to some of the challenges I have faced um, as a parent um, in the education system with, with two children on IEPs. In the beginning, when my, my older son, so this was back in 2012, we realized there were some challenges with his behavior. And we realized that in preschool, and then we had a house fire where we ended up not being in the district where we had originally thought we would be. So we moved um, after the start of the year into the Essex Town District. And we, I had no idea what being a parent of a child on an IEP actually meant, um, what an IEP even was or should be, or where to find that information. And nobody, Nobody really had a good answer of where to start to try and even become educated myself on some of that. I was thankfully connected eventually to Vermont Family Network um, through their family support. And they were able to really provide me with the information that empowered me to go to those meetings independently and be able to feel confident in advocating when it was uncomfortable. Being a parent in an IEP team is hard and emotional because you're so focused on your children and their best interests and, and making sure their needs are met. It's very similar to the feeling coming into this room and sitting at the table with, with you folks and knowing that I feel 100% safe, but that it is very scary to know that you actually have no control over what is happening other than what you're saying. And I think in an IEP meeting, there is this thought that parents should be team members and parents um, should have some of that voice. But oftentimes parents, my experience personally and my experience with the families I've supported over the years also has been that until you actually understand what is going on in that room, 
you're actually not being the most positive voice you can be because you don't always know what you should be saying or sometimes you think something isn't okay but because you don't understand it you you're not really right and oftentimes it's so emotional that as a parent with disabilities who has had to put my health to the side to ensure that my children's needs were met at times because things can get very intense in terms of the amount of time required. Um, it's easy to see why parents might feel a little bit scared or unsafe at times to, to be the one to, to continually say, hey, can we talk about this? Or hey, my son's not making progress. He hasn't learned any additional letters from the four he started the school year with. It's now February, what are we gonna do? Those aren't conversations you think about having in general as a, as a mom of a child who's not on an IEP and doesn't have special education. That's not something I've ever experienced in that realm. So I imagine if you don't have children who are a part of special education, you really um, might not understand necessarily what that process feels like how intense it is, or why some parents may not present with the most appropriate advocacy. Because I think there are a lot of times where parents, myself included, um, allow their emotions to rule when they don't know what else to do. So I think one of the things I've seen is when parents are provided with the resources or the education to inform themselves, it also allows them to be informed about the expectations on them as a member of the team. So how to respectfully advocate and appropriately advocate in that room without getting personal or without it becoming a conflict between you and the school. Because at the end of the day, when you're, when you're kind of feeling that conflict, you're not actually collaborating successfully together. And for me, I have been disabled since I was in my 20s. So I have lived without a disability and I've lived with a disability. And one of the benefits of being truly included in the IEP process was that I was finally able to look at full-time employment and not worry about losing my job because between my own health and my children's needs, it requires a lot of time away from my job. So by being included and by understanding the process and being able to advocate to various levels, including here at the State House in the past, it has taught me how to be in that room and how to also help other families get in that room. And when you're disabled or your child is disabled, that can be a very overwhelming process. I now sit on the Advisory Council for Child Poverty and Strengthening Families for the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights. I was recently hired as a Family Resource Coordinator for Early Intervention in, at Vermont Family Network. And the people they look at to hire those um, Family Resource Coordinators are people who parent children with disabilities um, or are disabled themselves. So they're providing opportunities to work to families who need a little bit more flexibility and can also meet families where they are in the process. So they can come in and, and kind of help them balance what they're experiencing and what the information they're getting is and connect them to the necessary resources. Katie, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions, too. And I just have one quick one for you. So in terms of the special ed process, um, if you can remember your first IEP meeting. Oh, I can very clearly. You can very clearly. Um, one of the questions that's always before us are, is our parents, did you feel adequately notified about what your rights were as a parent? I did not become yeah. adequately notified or informed of what my rights were for the first three years. And it took me accessing the Agency of Education and Vermont Family Network's Family Support Program to be able to be provided with that information and also to learn that my family's experienced um, homelessness in the school district and um, I'm not sure but Vermont was the fifth highest per capita rate of family homelessness in the country last year and in Vermont 
the highest number of homeless children being served is disabled children. So I wasn't even aware of the McKinney-Vento law when we had a homeless liaison after a house fire mm -hmm. and wasn't aware of any of the appeal process or anything and actually ended up having to go through multiple years of navigating between the AOE and the U.S. Department of Education and the district to be sure everyone was using the same process and paperwork because the district actually wasn't um, aware of the newer paperwork that was available on the AOE website. I would have only got a couple more minutes. Sorry, I was, I was told the 15 to 30 minute uh, yeah. window, so I'm just trying to give you guys as much. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> we're, in, we're kind of for, for working with the 15, unfortunately, at the moment. Are there other questions that people have? I think just one last point that yeah. I'd really like to make is one thing that would really support both parents of families with disabilities and ch parents of children with disabilities that may not be disabled themselves would just be to really, um, I know you guys have heard a lot of testimony about the Special Education Advisory Committee and all of that, and I just think um, there are a lot of parents out there who have struggled to present and maybe not have given the best picture of the value that parents can bring by sharing their experience and their voice when done respectfully and appropriately. And I think the better we can, as a state, come together to bridge the gap and, and help families not see it as a conflict with the district, but as an uncomfortable conversation that can be uncomfortable and still be productive. Absolutely. And I, as you, as you know, we just moved our special ed advisory panel um, we have one more day with it here and hopefully this will reinvigorate that that panel so that there are more parent representatives on on there because those voices are really critical they're only in school for part of the time but they're with you all the time absolutely I think that is is, is one of the the hardest things to, to navigate as a parent is recognizing that they are with you all the time so you do have a lot of knowledge but the value that the school team brings that they see in their day is is on the same level and allows you to when you can work together and have that consistent communication allows you to provide consistency in the home and in the school and and I've seen that significantly decrease the number of services that my son has needed to access um, to be in the classroom or, or to have adequate educational benefit. So I think there, there is some cost saving um, reasons to, to continue that very important discussion. Absolutely. Further um, questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, you okay. I just want to say I think you're awesome. <coughs> I was a guidance counselor at the Essex Middle School for most of my career, and I just think you're awesome. You're articulate. You know, you're an advocate. I, I just want to congratulate you because I, I really think you're wonderful. Thank you. And and the reason that I have been able to find my voice and advocate has been through my experiences with the school district even the negative ones and, and overcoming them and learning through them have really helped me to see how to, to do that. And so I really respect the quality of educators that we do have here in the state and think it's a very important balance to recognize. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're moving on to lead. Oh, oh and we're back to lead. Yes, we're back to lead. And Michael O'Grady is going to walk us through the bill. Mm. Oh, yeah. Is it on your face? Do you like the... Uh, yeah. uh, if you like that, I give it up. Yeah, don't try it. Unofficial or official? Oh, it's here. I don't know. It's shame on the It's there. That's all. Yeah. I don't see it. Yeah, sorry, I turned it off. It was getting super loud. Um, and just look for S40. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. That's okay. I'm okay. sure. Yeah. I'm if you don't want to let it print now. Yeah, that'd be great. I thought it was four. No, it's me. I don't know. It's just the deck with the deck. 
Thank you. We've been hearing a bit about this bill. Yeah, I just heard a little bit about it on the floor, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, would you like me to just walk us through? Would you walk us through the bill? Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Grady with the Legislative Council. Just going to give you a broad overview before you go into the um, line by line of the bill. Generally, this bill requires schools and child care providers to test outlets in buildings that are occupied by students and staff for lead. If results indicate exceedance of an action level above three parts per billion, the school, the child care provider is required to implement a lead remediation plan, prevent usage of that outlet until retesting indicates that it is uh, under the action level, or um, safe, I should say. Um, and then uh, there will be retesting required according to a schedule adopted by the Department of Health by rule. There is notification requirements to parents and staff prior to testing, and when the results are uh, down, and all results are posted on the Department of Health's website for total public transparency. Spending on the testing, um, I think you just heard a little bit on the floor about what the spending will be. Um, it is uh, contemplated that the Department of Health, the state, will pay for the initial testing. Uh, there would be a cost share for remediation. Um, and there would be two positions created, one at the Department of Health and one at the Agency of Natural Resources to staff the requirements. Any spending by a school would not be calculated as part of the excess spending calculation. Okay, so moving on directly into the bill. There is a new chapter being added in Title 18. Title 18 is the health chapter, so this is a program that's administered and implemented by the Department of Health. You'll see that there's a section 1241. The purpose of that section is to um, require all schools, and I'm just gonna say all schools throughout, but it is for school districts, supervisory unions, independent schools, and so it's every variant of school that you can think of. So all schools and child care providers to test drinking water in their buildings and child care facilities for lead, contamination, and develop an appropriate response for a lead remediation uh, when sampling indicates unsafe levels. So that's the purpose. There is a definition. Key definition is the action level. It's three parts per billion. Uh, I expect you heard testimony from the sponsor or the, the reporter why it's three parts per billion. Uh, building is any structure, facility, addition, or wing that may be occupied by children or students. Child care provider, there's a default definition of child care provider. Um, I can go through that if you would like, but it's basically those that are licensed by the state. Um, the child care facility is where the child care provider provides their services. The commissioner is the commissioner of health. Um, then you get to drinking water, which is non-carbonated water that is intended for human consumption or other consumer uses. First draw sample means a 250 milliliter sample of drinking water that has been standing in plumbing pipes at least eight hours, is collected without flushing the tap, and is conducted before the building or facility opens. So that's the first draw. That's where you are, it, it has been standing for eight hours, but there's also the flush sample, which is a sample of drinking water from an outlet. It's taken uh, from the outlet after the water has run for 30 seconds. And that's to try to, to, it helps to identify the source of the lead. If it's just been sitting in the pipes, there can be certain results, and if it's flowing, you can get other results. And so that, that is to help distinguish the source of the lead in the water. Outlet means a drinking water fixture currently or potentially used for consumption or cooking purposes, including a drinking fountain, ice machine, or a faucet. Later on in the bill, in 1243 subsection G, 
you'll see that bottled water and water in from vending machines is also not subject to this bill. You get a definition of potable water. Um, it's water sufficient for consumption and free from impurities. Um, I'm not going to go read the rest of it, but it needs to be free from. Uh, and that's really the definitions. That brings you to section 1243, the testing of drinking water. So first, the scope of testing, statement of what it is to require. It is to require testing by each school and each child care provider in the state in any uh, building or facility it owns, controls, or operates. All right, so moving on from there, you get the initial sampling on or before January 1, 2020. Each school or child care provider shall collect the first draw sample and the flush sample, and remember the two different samples from each outlet, each building or facility that owns, controls, or operates. Sampling occurs during the school year. The Senate committee wanted sampling to occur during real time conditions and not during the summer when there wasn't actual use of the building or the outlets. At least five days prior to sampling, the school or child care provider notifies all staff and parents uh, directly in writing or electronic means. They provide the schedule of sampling, the requirements for testing, why testing is required, and the potential health effects of exposure, information regarding how the school or child care provider shall provide notice of the sample results, and how the school district, school, child care provider shall respond to a sample that exceeds the action level. Now the department is going to be overseeing the program. They may adopt a schedule on how these schools or child care providers do the testing. That's important because later on you'll see that the department is, is responsible for conducting the lab analysis or contracting for the lab analysis. So they probably want to do it in a way so that not every school in the state is doing it in the same time period. So then there's a requirement for continued sampling after January of 2020, each school or child care provider shall sample each outlet in each building or facility it owns according to a schedule adopted by the Department of Health by rule. There is an interim methodology, and this trips up people a little bit. So ultimately the Senate wanted the, the, the department to set the requirements for testing, but they also wanted testing to go into place as soon as possible. So during that interim, before the rulemaking, they're saying that prior to adoption of those rules, sampling shall be conducted according to a methodology established by the Department of Health, provided that it has to be at least as stringent as EPA's three T's for reducing lead in drinking water in schools. Has anybody talked to you about the three we T's? Have not, we have not talked about the three T's. So that, that's one thing that We've you, been talking about a lot, but we have not actually talked about what we mean by each T's. Mean, sure. <laughs> Uh, it's basically a guidance document that EPA has published, and they've published it for, for uh, many years now, which provides information on, to schools on why to test, how to test, the methodology, methodology for testing. Um, it does provide uh, guidance for notification. So it's, it's effectively um, kind of a framework for how uh, schools or states can do this testing. What do the T stand for? Uh, testing, treatment, and treatment. Training. training. All right. Oh. Um, I didn't hear the treatment part, though. I only did the training and the testing. So. <laughs> All right. So then we go on. Should I move on? Yes. On page five, you're in subsection E, waiver. There is this uh, provision that the commissioner shall waive the requirements for a school or child care provider to do the sampling if they have completed sampling of outlets in their buildings uh, proceed in the calendar year preceding January 1, 2020. They conducted that sampling according to a methodology uh, consistent with the departments and they implemented or scheduled remediation that ensures drinking water from all outlets does not exceed the action level. So I'm sure you know that there was a pilot program that went on and this is basically to address those schools in the pilot program. They don't need to retest again if they've already tested within the previous calendar year and are scheduling 
um, remediation for exceedances. Um, but those schools are still eligible to receive financial assistance from the state for the cost of remediation that's been implemented. The Senate did not want to penalize schools in the pilot project um, for their participation in the pilot project. So at the top of page six, you'll see the laboratory analysis um, requirement I referenced earlier. The analyses of drinking water samples required shall be conducted by the Department of Health or someone that the, the lab that the department contracts with. Then you get to page six sub G, the application to bottled water. Um, the Senate wanted to express its intent that its, it, its, its intent is to achieve significant reductions in lead levels in all drinking water provided to children in schools or child care providers. With that said, they recognize that there is an acceptable lead level in bottled water by the FDA, and so in bottled water from vending machines and bottled water from water dispensers shall be exempt from the requirement. So FDA is the one that set the five? For bottled water, there is an FDA standard is five parts per billion. Do we know what they based that on? I, think. Uh, I don't know the basis of it, but I can find you the <coughs> basis of that if you would like. We're just having a lot of numbers thrown out, and I'm just struggling with, with what they all mean. And sure. Where we, where, we, where we throw the dark. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to hear numbers anywhere from 0 to 20. Um, and I can talk about that now if you would like or not. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so 0, uh, generally, uh, scientifically, there's no safe level of, of lead. Um, it has an impact. And that's according to EPA and other scientists. But EPA has set an action level of 15 parts per billion, meaning that if that is tested or found in a sample to be in water, that according to them, that is when uh, a public water system <coughs> or anyone else required to test should do something to, to remediate, to, to cause it, the water to, to get below that, that 15 parts per billion. Do you know when that was set? Uh, I don't know the date, but I can find out. What confuses things somewhat is that they also issued a guidance document that said you really need to start worrying about it when it's at 20 parts per billion. So basically, you'll see some states with lead testing at 20 parts per billion, and they base that off of that EPA guidance. But when the actual action level is 15, and some states have already implemented lower than 15. There are three states, or three jurisdictions. There's the District of Columbia, Illinois, and I think Montana. Pennsylvania. Hmm? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I thought Pennsylvania just went up to 15. But anyway, there's a third state out there. Um, so, and Montana may have just proposed it by rule. That's why I'm thinking that it's Montana. But um, so that's where you get zero. That's where you get five because some states have five. Um, Fifteen is from the EPA action level. Twenty is from a guidance document that they had issued as well. Um, three was based on the Senate's uh, review of the testimony they received, review of um, how other states are contemplating going below 15. Uh, and what they thought was achievable um, and affordable. So in terms of all 50 states, is the action level across the board 15? Or some have something and some have nothing? So there's a maximum contaminant level, <coughs> contaminant level of 15 parts per billion for public water systems, all right? Not all schools are public water systems. Some schools in Vermont are a public water system, and they are already testing either biannually or quarterly for lead. Um, and if they exceed that, then there are requirements under the water supply rule for what that, well, it's 
the water supply rule just cross references the US EPA's rules for lead and copper. So basically, you would have to do what the US EPA rules say if you have an exceedance of the 15 parts per billion. So, just to be really concrete here, then, if I walk into any public building around the country that's considered a public building, I can be guaranteed, because everybody is following the rule and the law, that it would be 15 or less. Or they'd be breaking the law. First, <coughs> there are, there's a, there are different kinds of public water systems. So not everything that you think is a public building is subject to this. So that's the first thing. There's community public water systems. There's non-community public water systems. There's transient non-community and community public water systems. And there's non-transient um, non-community and community water systems. Now, I so don't really not. want to tell you the definition <laughs> because one of them is it's not the other. Right. So. Yeah. Right. But I can feel comfortable in the post office. Right. Just bring your own bottle of water. That's, that's probably a transient public community system. And yes, I think that they would be subject to this. I'm going to back away from this question when I'm questioning. <laughs> so there are four different categories. Yeah. And what is most typical in Vermont schools? Um, that's. They're not all public water systems to begin with, right? Right. So if they're getting their water from, from, um, like a community system, like like use Champlain water, in Chicken. And so most of those schools are getting their water from the, Ch the Champlain Water District, and and that is the public water system. They are the ones that are required to test. The schools aren't required to test, but if a school is on a well. They, they likely are a public water system that has to test. I had the numbers um, originally. I don't have the numbers in my head now. I can get you the numbers about the number of schools that are public water systems. Okay, thank you. Let's keep going. Okay, moving on to 1244, the response to actionable levels. So. If the sample indicates an exceedance of the action level at the outlet, the school child care provider shall conduct remediation. It's required. And it's to eliminate or reduce the lead levels from the outlet. And the Senate wanted to be have a kind of a, a directory statement, not necessarily mandatory, that they wanted to direct schools and child care facilities to try and achieve the lowest level possible in drinking water. And at a minimum, shall prohibit use of the outlet um, until a lead remediation plan or remediation approved is implemented. Um, sampling indicates that the lead levels are below the action level, the outlet is, or the outlet is permanently removed and cannot be accessed by a person. After lead a remediation plan or other approved remediation, remediation is implemented, Retest the outlet until results indicate the levels are below the action level, and then provide occupants of the building an adequate supply of potable water until remediation is performed. They must also notify all staff and all parents directly of the test results in writing or by electronic means within 10 business days after receipt. And they have to submit their lead remediation plan to the department as they are completed. As I referenced in the overview, there are record keeping requirements. The department retains all records of test results, lab analysis, lead remediation plans, and waiver requests for 10 years. And the records produced are public. And then there's a public notification the commissioner shall publish on the DOH website the data from testing so that the results are fully transparent and accessible. The data shall include a list of all buildings or facilities at which an outlet exceeded the action level within the previous two years. And the commissioner shall publish all retesting data on the website within two weeks of receipt. Then the Agency of Education shall include a link on its website to the Department of Health website 
So in case someone was thinking, oh, I can find this information on the Agency of Education website, even though the Agency of Education has no mandate under this, they will still be able to find that information. Um, there is a consultation requirement in section 1246 when a lab analysis shows an exceedance, the school or child care provider shall consult with the commissioner on how to develop a lead remediation plan. There's also a guidance provision, the commissioner of the Department of Health shall issue guidance on development of the lead remediation plan by a school or child care provider and they shall reference the US EPA's three T's. There's rulemaking. Remember, there's the interim methodology for initial sampling. There's continued sampling. The rulemaking is the requirements um, for sampling after uh, the interim or the initial sampling. So on or before November 1, 2020, the commissioner shall adopt rules regarding implementation of the requirements. The rules shall include requirements for sampling. Um, the rules shall include requirements for frequency of sampling. The rules will include requirements for implementation of the lead mitigation plan or other necessary response. They will include conditions or criteria for waiver and any other requirements the commissioner deems necessary. There is an enforcement provision. This is to provide some incentive, but it's after a notice and an opportunity for hearing. The Senate contemplated that if the school wasn't complying, that the Commissioner of Health would provide notice to that school, give that school an opportunity to come into compliance. If they don't, there's still an opportunity for a hearing and for the opportunity for the school to come into compliance then. If they still don't, they can impose an administrative penalty of up to $500 for a violation. Penalties that are not designated where they go are paid to the state. And if there's no special fund for where they will be uh, put in, like victim services, they, the money goes into the general fund. So if there's a penalty, it's paid into the general fund. I'm sorry, where does it say that? If there's a penalty, if someone... Where is it? I just was wondering where this was. 1248. 1248, okay. Um, okay on page you. 10, section 2, this is the definition of education spending. I do not want to go through this in detail because I don't really understand it. But I know that <coughs> on page 11, uh, B11, that the costs incurred by a school district or supervisory union when sampling drinking water outlets uh, shall not be included in the calculation of education spending. You'll see that it's just school districts or supervisory unions and not independent schools because they're not subject to the excess spending calculation. Then you'll see section three, the position sampling of drinking water outlets in school, one position at ANR, an environmental analyst, and one position at the Department of Health, a public health analyst. The bill takes effect on passage. So I'm sorry, it's two positions. Yep. One is Department of Health. What, what is the agency? What's the what person at ANR? ANR uh, is, well, stepping back, ANR generally has jurisdiction over testing of, of public water systems, yeah. testing of, of wells, etc. So they are going to be uh, important or engaged in the process um, regarding testing. And they believe that they need this position. Uh, and it's initially intended to be limited service. <coughs> Permanent, so meaning it will go away after it's not necessary. Questions? They did a fiscal note, I'm sure. Pardon me? Uh, they did a fiscal note? They did. We're having uh, Stephanie come in to explain that this afternoon. Okay. okay. <coughs> Question? Yes, Representative Two. Um, on page seven, <coughs> uh, four, section four, says the Norfolk file staff <coughs> and parents or guardians. Um, there's nothing in there that says they, is there a reason why they left students out if they don't tell the students? Um, Maybe that's not a big question for you. I, you know, I think they were looking to, to 
get notice to the adults. Um, I do know that most of the guidance documents out there, it's about notice to the parents and the staff and other users sometimes in, in other states. But mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't recall, and maybe some of the advocates can correct me, I don't recall the requirement to notify the students themselves. <coughs> I'm just thinking of the, the ones. Yeah. The ones right. yeah. Okay. Representative Jean Batista. Uh, on the last page where the limited service positions are authorized, uh, I assume that was done with an assumption that funding would be in budget adjustments or any future iteration of the bill in which positions were funded for the fiscal 20 budget that would need to reflect that, I take it? Yes. Okay. okay. Right, because this was the, as you'll see, about the fourth line from the bottom. It was authorized in the fiscal year 2019. Actually, one more question. Yeah. Uh, this might be for Stephanie. Um, <coughs> sounds like we're going to join fiscal move shortly. But uh, limited service position does not carry a, it's not a full-time FTE, but it's just for a period of time, and their service uh, term is dependent upon whatever's funded. I think it depends. Okay. Right? It depends on the position. Um, sometimes they are <clears throat> temporary full-time or full-time temporary, I can't remember. Um, so they are FTEs. And it, um, so I think you're going to have to talk to Stephanie about how this was going to be funded, especially for her this one. Representative Hines. Uh, is it in rulemaking where details will be worked out? I think about uh, Child care centers, or, or an in-home child registered daycare, uh, where only a portion of the house is used for for that, would it be within rulemaking where they would say, okay, only those, you know, fixtures that serve the child care portion of the residence would need to be tested, or does the testing be spelled out? Right now, the outlet is a drinking water fixture currently or potentially used for consumption or cooking purposes. So if there was an outlet in that facility that potentially could be used for drinking water or cooking, this would require testing. All right. Now, there was contemplated that if, if, if users, students, staff didn't have access to like a sink in a janitor's closet, that that wouldn't need to be tested, but where there's that possibility for access that it was contemplated, it would be tested. With that said, child, some child care facilities are already required to test. It's usually on the, on their, the term of their, the renewal of their license, um, and it can be more frequent depending on if they show an exceedance. You have to see this true for registered as opposed to licensed? It's it's licensed, I believe, right now. Representative Austin, if um, if a facility is found to have a bug where you being tested, and the parents want the child tested to see if there's been any bug poisoning, I'm assuming the parents incur the cost of that. Um, this bill does not contemplate those costs of testing the child, doing the blood test for the child. I'm just wondering, in, in the course of developing this bill, did the committee in the Senate consider uh, the Department of Children and Families, because we're talking about child care centers here, and I know that the Department of Health is part of the Agency of Human Services, but we seem to have a direct nexus to the Agency of Education for Schools, but it feels as though there's a lack of connection to CDD or whoever would be doing the child care uh, licensure. Uh, I believe the Department of Health has the child care facility rule. No, not you? Well, then it's DCF. Yes. Um, no, there wasn't any contemplation or coordination that I know of with DCF. But I would have to go back and look at the rules. I know that the chair of human services will want this bill um, there. Our understanding, though, is that um, licensed child care facilities are required to do monitoring, but they're not held to the standard of, of three. Is that correct? <coughs> are they 15? Is that what they're 15. 
just got new parking felt over here. <laughs> Other questions? I'll just follow up on yours, speaking with the non-witness. <coughs> and that's yes. licensed versus registered, right? Reserve it. So this is David Inler, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor of the Commissioner of Health. Um, all licensed child care facilities, all licensed child care providers are required to test. So they're, so they're all licensed. It's just different kinds of licensees. Okay. And so they're required to test consistent with the water supply rule. So today that's 50. Yeah. So this bill would, would change. Correct. But it would be adjusting that, yeah. Other questions? So actually, can I? Yes, please. Because I've heard people say that this, this changes other requirements in law, yeah. that it impeels by implication the MCL, maximum contaminant level for public water system. Right. And, and I don't agree with that. Um, because impeal by implication, the legislature needs to show that they intended to impeal by implication in a manner that the, the two different laws are so repugnant to each other that it would be, it's clear that the legislator, legislature intended to in, repeal by implication or that they are so overlapping in scope that they both cannot be implemented independently. And so if you're a child care facility that has to show testing of, that they meet the 15 parts per billion once every three to five years, I can't remember the term, you can do that and still conduct testing for three parts per billion every year or whatever frequency of retesting will be required. I, I don't see, I see the, you can do both of these without them being repugnant mm -hmm. to each other. Similarly with the public water system, this bill is a Department of Health bill. Public water systems are an agency of natural resources program. The water supply rule applies to public water systems. This bill only applies to schools and child care providers. Child care providers can test for three parts per billion and those that are public water systems can conduct testing for the 15 parts per billion on a quarterly or biannual basis. I, I don't see I don't see repugnancy. I don't see overlap that, that creates total conflict that prevents them from doing both. Representative Elder? Curious how the number of three parts per billion was arrived at. I'm just noticing in the pilot study that was completed, um, one part per billion was used. And so a lot of the data range that we have, if we wanted to try to extrapolate this pilot study that had been done, is not really in a particularly useful range data wise. Um, I'm just kind of wondering. How do they get from the pilot study measuring with really just the number of one PPP and 15? Where did three PPP come into it in the course of the Senate development? Can you, uh, you can speak to that? The, the committee took testimony from, from um, scientists, experts, and others, looked at levels in other states, and tried to set a standard that they thought was as protective of children as possible while still being implementable and relatively affordable. Okay. They were trying to be ambitious and they definitely had discussions about going lower. Clarify. So, if we have a, a public water system such as the State <laughs> Water District, we have water that's coming in from Lake Champlain. It goes to the facility there. It's treated. It's sent down the line with other things going on with the water as, as it goes. And th this bill is only talking about really pretty much what's happened at the level of the faucet, whereas ANR is checking what's ha happening with the water more before it's leaving the. Right. the water. Well, ANR's requirements. <coughs> they're supposed to do. The public water system isn't just the plant where the water is, is brought in. It is the entire system, including 
the, the piping and the satellite pumping stations, etc. So they're supposed to test throughout the, the extension of the, the system. Um, but that's about what's in the water. The fact that, that the fixture might be made out of lead um, is not governed by that. Um, and that seems to be the major one of the major sources of uh, of lead that we're dealing with is actually at the level of the fixture. That 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 is that <coughs> has been the testimony. Yes. Now Vermont banned lead or, or banned it to a certain point. There's a de minimis level that's allowed in plumbing fixtures, but that did not go into place until uh, 2008, maybe. And was there an update in 2014? The federal. The federal rule complied with what had previously been California, Vermont, and New Jersey, I believe. And so basically, from 2008 to 2014, my understanding, limited research, is that a lot of manufacturers had dual assembly lines going, and that there was not necessarily a lot of fidelity in maintaining. So in other words, 2008 to 2014, what you're going to get it's called a lead-free faucet, which is at the 0.25% as opposed to the 8%. It's not such a sure thing, it sounds like. And so if you really wanted to look, you need to look at the MSF certified as opposed to compliant, because you can just report compliance without testing. There's now a category, but it really starts in 2015 with what was commercially available. So it, it's pretty recent. Right to you. <laughs> he knows more than I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I drafted the Vermont. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> One thing I was just noticing in the pilot project is that it really seems like the strong recommendation is to go to bottle fillers, right? For these bottle filling stations seems like one of the best practices. And I have been interested in this just because it kind of seems that like we're gonna do all this testing to basically tell us something that we kind of already know which is that any fixture made before 2015 probably has an 8% lead level in it and is going to keep causing elevated lead levels as long as you use it, as long as water sits in it. So I just wonder to some extent, should we just be going through and saying, we're getting rid of all fixtures that are older and we're going to take that one and a half million for all the testing we're going to do it and we're going to put it into subsidizing bottle filling stations or just and I know that that's a pretty different route to get there. It's just as I've been kind of looking at this, it kind of seems, I guess the strongest argument I can hear against that is, well, there's a lot of faucets out there that might have an 8% lead level, but they're not causing elevated readings. So if we did that, potentially, test, testing would mean that maybe we'd only have to replace 20% instead of 100%. But it doesn't seem to me that there's any reason to believe that you're not going to have an elevated lead level later because you're just leaving all these faucets in place that have 8% lead in them. Um, I've also read that there's totally different readings you can get out of a system if a system has chlorine in it as opposed to if it has chloramine in it. That leads to a different lead level and that has nothing to do with the fixture. So it, anyway, I'm sorry to get so in the weeds. I'm just, I'm just not convinced that this million and a half of testing is well spent when there's 2.4 total. I guess that's my point in the end. So there is a correlation to disinfected byproducts with lead? Is that your understanding? Uh, there can be, yes. Um, My favorite old, old topic from the old days. Right. Yeah. Does everyone know what a disinfectant byproduct is? Um, there are requirements under the Safe Drinking Water Act, Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, for water systems to treat their water to, to certain safety standards. Treatment can actually create byproducts which can have health effects as well. So there are secondary treatment standards that are intended to treat the byproducts of the initial disinfection. And those secondary, the, the, the disinfectant byproducts can can be harmful, and the, and the case study that people use is that there is a there's an island off the coast of Virginia that's treating its water um, prior to the secondary treatment standard 
um, provisions, treating its water according to the Safe Drinking Water Act, multiple, multiple um, failed pregnancies, um, birth issues, and it was from the disinfected byproducts in the water. Representative James? Okay. No, that was one of the questions I asked yesterday. I didn't get it. I didn't get that clarification. Thank, Thank you, Michael. May I interrogate the member from Starksburg? <laughs> 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 uh, or, and maybe this isn't the time to do that. So, um, let me just see who else we have going here. Okay. We, we've got Caleb here all the time, so. Yeah. Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. I see that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> so let's keep the focus a little bit with, with our attorney at the moment. So, okay. so the, the, the three was just kind of a educated guess as to say it's as close to zero as we can get, uh, also being not so restrictive at the actionable level. Three is the actionable level. Yes. There, there was testimony in the Senate committee about going that it should be zero, mm -hmm. that there is no safe level. Um, and that that zero may be achieved. Um, and that they heard testimony, you'll probably hear similar testimony. Mm -hmm. um, what the what the state agencies think should be done versus what the child health advocates think should be done. I think everybody right. thinks something should be done. Right. It's just, uh, the specifics. Is there anybody that um, they did not have time to uh, ask to testify that you think would be that you would be willing to recommend? Us? Uh, not that I'm aware of. <coughs> they, they, had a, they had a pretty good list. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else for? Michael Grady. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Elena. Just change everything. Oh, no. If you want to show them those things, you can. It's okay. You can. Through that screen if you want to. Thanks. Yeah, no, I want focus. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. There. Um, I have my laptop because I don't have the hard copy of the most recent bill. But okay, for the record, my name is Elena Mahali. I am uh, an attorney at Conservation Law Foundation. Thank you, Chair Webb, for the time to testify this afternoon. I want to, uh, I submitted some written testimony, uh, and I'm going to just pull out some of the highlights based on the conversation that I've heard this committee have already and the questions that have come up. So hopefully, I can just hone in on the real questions you have. The first is the action level. CLF is one of the organizations that is advocating for the action level to be one part per billion. There's no debate, I think, as you all heard from the scientific and the medical health community, that there is no safe level of lead for children or anyone to be exposed to. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the uh, national toxicology program have done research showing that even trace levels, minuscule levels of lead exposure have severe, lifelong, irreversible consequences for kids and adults. And for that reason, the American Academy of Pediatrics and our own Vermont Department of Health have set an advisory level of one part per billion. That is the health-based standard. So that has been set. There are really adverse consequences that I just want to take the time to walk through because I think we sometimes just say, oh, they're really bad health impacts and don't really focus on them. So I want to take a minute. So once water is ingested that has lead in it, it flows from the blood to the brain to the kidneys and the bones. And in children, the impacts that this can cause are attention deficit disorders, like ADHD, decreased IQ level, delayed learning and behavioral problems, decreased hearing, decreased growth in terms of stature, decreased kidney function, 
And we know that it's just as deleterious for adults as well, who, let's not forget that there are teachers in these places, uh, and there are staff in the child care centers. And in terms of the adverse impacts to adults, we know that lead can cause decreased kidney function. Again, that is really a, an area that's focused on increased blood pressure, incidence of hypertension, other cardiovascular effects. And in pregnant women especially, it's very damaging. Early births, stillbirths, miscarriages, terrible impacts to pregnant women. And we know that there are significant costs of lead exposure on the individual that's being exposed, but also on society writ large. The testimony that I've just been witness to today and yesterday talking about behavioral issues in uh, the number of students that are, are needing extra attention. Uh, the loss of IQ in a student and increased susceptibility to attention deficit disorders, that has a significant cost beyond just that student on our entire education system. We're also uh, seeing research come out that's documenting a strong correlation between childhood lead exposure and violent crimes which has both a direct economic cost in the millions of dollars, but other costs in society that are much harder to quantify. Lead exposure also creates mental health emergencies for parents and families that learn that their children were exposed to lead for sometimes a decade in school and they didn't know it. Parents have described guilt, extreme stress and anxiety, sometimes even suicidal thoughts after learning that they have not known and not prevented their child from getting exposed day after day when they go to school or when their infant is going to a child care center. Especially the infant, the early stages, zero to five, that is when the primary architecture of the brain is being built. And that is when kids are most susceptible to these toxic impacts. So to the extent that anyone is trying to get child care centers out of this bill, I would urge this committee to bear that in mind, that actually those are the most vulnerable Vermonters that we should be protecting. Public health experts estimated that the lead exposure crisis in Flint, Michigan could cost that city $400 million and thousands of cumulative years of poor health and impacted children. These costs to individual children, to families, to society, on the whole, they far outweigh the, any estimates for the costs of preventing exposure. Remember from that Vermont uh, pilot study that the uh, cost of remediation was no more than $500 for the majority of those schools. So when we talk about cost per school. So according to that study, um, I believe that $500 was the maximum that any school paid for remediation. Now, those are specifically taps, replacement of fixtures. We're not talking about bigger reparations like lead service lines, but uh, that's that's what was reported in that pilot study. The reason I ask is they said something like 450 schools with 50 taps. Sounds like a lot of taps. There are uh, more taps than you would think in yeah. schools. Um, and I think that goes to something that Dr. Costanza was talking about yesterday, how one option is to actually just take out of service a tap since there are so many taps in schools. But my point is that when we talk about costs, we have to talk about all the costs not only the cost of uh, the individual impact, but society, uh, the economy. And it's important to just have a, a whole frame, big picture. I, the second thing I want to just note is that one part per billion, I think Dr. Costanza yesterday uh, from Middlebury made my case for me that one part per billion is achievable. So to the extent that we're, you're asking if three was the actionable 
Um, one has been demonstrated to be a number that schools can and are already meeting. So we already have schools throughout Vermont that are meeting the one part per billion standard. Uh, we know that replacing, if they're not, that replacing the tap is often a very low cost, low hanging fruit option to routinely get to one part per billion. It won't always, but it is a low cost option. And uh, Representative Elder brought up the notion of NSF certified filters. These are readily available on the market filters that can reliably get water levels down to one part per billion or below, even when challenged. So an EPA study coming out of the Flint crisis, they looked at 200 samples of water containing over 150 parts per billion of lead and they ran them through these filters and reliably got down to below one part per billion. I think in fact 80% of them had a detection, uh, a non-detect level of lead. So, so if we had a detect, if, if, if action level was at three, once it got repaired with the, these new faucets, that's gonna bring it down below at one anyway, correct? That makes sense. Most likely, right. if you install a filter, right. you will get down to, if it's an NSF certified filter, yeah. in most scenarios, you will get down to below one. Yes. I also want to talk about the 15 part per billion standard that's been talked about. It took me as an advocate that works in water quality for my living a long time to understand this. So I, I know that this is some maybe some repeat, but hopefully helps clarify. So the Department of Environmental Conservation yesterday talked about EPA setting what's called this MCL, a maximum contaminant level of 15 parts per billion. Uh, they assert that this represents what's technically feasible and cost effective. And I, I just want to note that reliance on that EPA level for schools and for daycare centers is a very different scenario than relying on that for a big public water system for a couple of reasons. First, it's, it's not a health-based standard. We know that because the Vermont Department of Health's own health advisory is one part per billion. Second, it's an outdated standard. It was first promulgated in 1991, and it remains largely unchanged since then. So it's almost a 30-year-old standard. It also is primarily based on corrosion control technology that is available to an entire water system, as opposed to other technological options that are available to schools on a tap, individual tap basis to remove lead. So it's a standard based on what a whole system is technically available, like reasonably available to them to, to do to address lead versus what a school can do at a tap wide basis. Can I just clarify yeah. something? You're saying that the 15 part per billion, per billion, per billion was basically a corrosive level and that was a concern versus a health Concern? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's so it was necessarily to, to protect the water system, but not necessarily the health. Yes. Okay. It's it's also it's a standard that EPA has to take into consideration what's the available technology and the available technology to a system, and what that would cost for a system is different than if EPA were looking at an individual school and what they could do. So what I'm saying is it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges to say that the 15 part per billion standard is applicable to schools because EPA just didn't, that wasn't a part of their calculus when they were setting that action level over almost 30 years ago. And it fine. would be, I actually would appreciate that, um, to, to verify that with, with research to, so that you could get that clarified because if we get to this event so we're going to have to say why we're not doing 15, we're doing something else and that feels very important. I'm happy to provide that. Um, I will also, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. 
Um, also, just I, I'm not understanding um, what you're saying about the the Vermont Department of Health has set an advisory level at one. What's that? What is how does advisory level differ then from what we're talking about here? Well, I can defer. I can give you an answer, but Department of Health is here. My okay. answer would be that it's a uh, when it's an advisory, it's 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 a guideline to be used. Um, it's not enforceable. And what we're talking about here, what we're asking for, is to use that guideline to set an enforceable standard that we can actually uh, require remediation to that standard. Right now, it's serving as, as guidance. And what I was going to say is that we've heard about this three T's document. I think Dr. Costanza yesterday referred to it as the Bible of lead lead testing and uh, that EPA had put out. And that updated 3T's book, so it was last updated, I believe, in 2006. EPA itself said that 15 parts per billion is not a health-based standard. And we recommend that states, quote, set the lowest possible action level in consideration of whatever the guidance is from the health department. Here, our health department's guidance has set a standard of one part per billion. So the EPA's own 3Ts document implores the state to set that level, that action level, at whatever the Vermont Department of, whatever the State Department of Health has guided them is the health-based standard. I can submit the three T's document with that language in it. In your opinion, would it be a good practice to to have lead-free brass fixtures in all our schools, regardless of where any testing shows? So you perfectly teed up another one of my points, which is that we should consider adding this. I adding language to this bill that actually is is getting us towards proactively getting the lead out of our systems. Because in a way, what we're talking about here is testing to see if there's a problem in our body and then putting a Band-Aid over it uh, when we install a filter. But so long, the most effective way to eliminate lead <coughs> exposure is to eliminate the source of lead. And so, what we're seeing other states do in their legislation, because by now over 16 states or 15 states, one district has passed legislation dealing with lead in schools, and several of them have incorporated language, which CLF provided in a red line of the bill with our testimony, uh, to actually get schools to start planning and inventorying where there is lead in their fixtures, uh, their, their actual service lines that are delivering lead to them so that schools can get a better gra grasp on where our problem is and how prolific is it and, uh, and start working towards actually just re taking out the lead because as you know, we've, um, we have much better standards now for how much lead is allowable in lead-free fixtures. So um, in many cases, we are overdue in looking at the actual service lines that are delivering the lead. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it kind of does. I mean, what I've heard from Professor Costanza is that in her estimation, uh, distal piping was really not shown to be much of an issue. It was in the pilot project, the fact that flush samples routinely were a lot lower seemed to really indicate that the problem was in the fixture. Um, so I mean, yeah, it would be interesting to look at it. The only other clarifying point I had is I wasn't actually referring to an NSF um, certified filter before. I was talking about the actual certified brass, lead-free oh, okay. brass. And I think there is what you're referring to as well, a filter. But yeah, just this idea that if we know there is a type of brass that is effectively lead free, and that the other type of brass is the leading culprit. Um, just whether, regardless of what any tests say, whether we want to be moving towards a place where we have no more, I'll call them leaded <laughs> drinking 
faucets in our schools. I believe, and, and perhaps one of the other witnesses in the room can help me here, but I believe that that is one of the movements that other states have been taking is, is you know, parents are calling schools and this three T's book or guidance from EPA has a list of, of sort of the culprits of uh, faucets and taps that do, do cause the worst problems. And so it's kind of something that parents have been starting to ask of their schools, hey, at the very least, could you make sure that we don't have any of these bad culprits at our school? Um, but I, I think what you're saying, is it sort of falls into the remediation steps that a school would want to consider to try. There is that retesting. So there is an option to sort of replace something, see if that addresses the problem. And I would think that schools would first go to the most inexpensive solution uh, in an attempt to see if that helps the problem. I already uh, touched on this, but I just want to hammer home that child care centers really need to be included in this, in this bill. And just to summarize why, I think we've heard smatterings of that from other people. Uh, the current program, they do have a testing program. However, the, Dr. Costanza hit on this yesterday. The method that they're using is the same method as the community water systems are subject to. And the actual sample size that they're taking from the faucet is one liter instead of 250 milliliters. And the effect of this is to dilute the sample. And it does not give a accurate reading of what the first draw really contains. So that's one problem with the current regulation. Another problem is that the testing is not frequent enough. Uh, licensing happens every six years and uh, there are many different things that can impact the outcome of a test. Uh, it can be impacted by the rate of the water flow. It can be impacted by whatever the system is using to disinfect. It can be impacted by construction that's happening outside that's jostling the, the lead service lines themselves. There are a lot of things that can impact lead testing. And you'll note in our written testimony that one of the amendments we suggest is that this statute actually address the frequency of testing. Uh, because that is a very important part of making sure that this is an effective solution, is that we're testing with enough frequency where we actually are able to capture changes that happen. And it, it's not fair to have certain kids be able to move through the whole school system or their, their whole middle school experience and never have a test happen during that time. Um, so. Also, the child care centers are subject to the 15 part per billion, which, as I alluded to before, is not a, a health-based standard or a standard that should be applied at that individualized level. Uh, I mentioned the note about proactively planning and getting the lead out, and uh, that CLF submitted a red line of the uh, recent version of the bill uh, with suggested changes for all of the things that I'm talking about today. So I hope that's helpful to the committee. Uh, but I just want to end with the three main things we'd like to see amended. One, we want to see that action level go down from three parts per billion to one part per billion to the Vermont health-based standard. And I'm happy to provide the committee with the language in the three T's manual that I referred to. Two, we would like to see language inserted that gets us towards preventing this problem from happening in the first place. So I call that get the let out language. And we've included a section of red line in our testimony identifying that. And the third is that testing happen annually going forward. We feel like this is a reasonable way to pick up on changes that are happening that could impact the tests. Uh, and we would be open to some 
method where a portion of the school is being tested every year so that schools don't have to take it all on at one time, but it's sort of a rotating testing cycle. Uh, but we think that should be identified in statute and not left to rule. And there's one other uh, red line in there that I want to note. Uh, it basically, the bill identifies a couple of things that, that the legislature would like to see in the agency's rule. And one of those is guidance or requirements on testing methodology. And for reasons that I think were really highlighted by Dr. Costanza when she gave the New York example, we can't have guidance alone on how samples are taken. We need to have requirements. So it should just be requirements, not guidance or requirements. We need everyone to be sampling with the same methodology and held to that. And that's in rule. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's in, right now, the way that the statute is written is that the rule should provide guidance or requirements. And we just want the statute to say requirements. Yeah. So uh, to conclude, and then I'll take, happy to take questions. Uh, you know, CLF works on a variety of very conf complex environmental pollution problems, uh, from climate change to, we were just talking yesterday, phosphorus into Lake Champlain, that have myriad uh, multifaceted solutions that take a long time to, to get our heads around. This is not one of them. This is a solvable problem, and uh, I hope that, you know, I think this bill really gets us a huge step forward uh, with the suggestions that I just gave, especially the action level. Uh, this is a problem that we're ready to tackle. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear still from the um, Department of Health, and we're going to hear from um, Jeff Ald. And I don't I don't have you on the list, do I, Jeff? Not today. Not today. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions? Are we gonna hear from the agency? From the agency of education? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They did, sorry, they did. Yeah, yeah. not today. Not <coughs> no, they they wanna weigh in. I just wanna second your request for data. The data. You were you talking about a lot of data in terms of the effect of lead on children and the res medical results. Yes. We have to have. Absolutely. I have materials that I have shared electronically and have some hard copy if you're interested. Great. I did and also just happens. post the um, web page that directs you to the toolkit for the EPA's 3Ts. So that's under Elena's name. If you have more, please send them to me. But that Great. is there for a start. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Great. we'll probably get you back. And mark that point. Happy to do that. Um, but I do want to get David and Linda from the Department of Health. And then Stephanie will pick you up for that. Do you mind if I just ask you a quick question? Sure. What is, what is the reasoning for the rotating cycle uh, for testing? Um, I think CLF thinks it should happen annually, and the rotating cycle was a way to alleviate the burden on schools to every year do their entire system. But it was this notion that every year they would do a portion of their system so that that way you capture potential systemic problems like there's construction going on outside, or this, the water system has this year changed to a different uh, treatment solution so that you don't wait four years before you uncover that, but sure. that you're doing some testing in some part of your school every year. Got it. Is that helpful? Definitely. OK. OK. So for the record. For the record, my name is David Engelder. I'm senior policy and legal advisor for Commissioner Health. I'm delighted to be before you. Um, I don't. I don't have written testimony. My, my my main intention in being here is to answer questions you may have, and uh, which I'll be able to answer a subset. And there'll be even more questions that I will probably not be able to answer, but I will do my best. Um, I do want to just actually make a quick prefatory remark or two, which is. Um, the Department of Health strongly su su supports the testing. This, this, uh, the idea of testing originated I'm at the Department of Health with our partners at DEC three years ago. 
um, and, and when we started having conversations about a pilot going into schools and seeing what was out there, um, following the experiences of uh, what happened in, in Flint, Michigan. Um, and, uh, and so you know that the, the, the seriousness with which the Department of Health has taken this, we've actually already begun, we've opened what's called the Health Operations Center, or the HOC, which is something that is done typically in response to a, um, a potential epidemic or a foodborne illness. So we have, we have all the folks um, from epidemiology to environmental health to logistics to finance who sit in a room for half an hour every day, um, excuse me, every day, every week. If it's a foodborne illness, we do it every day. In the case of, of water, uh, of this project, we're, we're meeting once a week. So the Department of Health is already sort of spinning up and, and, and ready to, to, to meet this, uh, the requirements of the law. Um, so with, with that, I, would, I, I think there's been a series of questions that have been asked that I will do my best to, to answer succinctly and carefully. So, so David is um, legal counsel to the Department of Health. So this is an opportunity for us to get um, so one of the questions I had is, we just heard a distinction between the 15 and the 3 is the 15 yes. by EPA is actionable for corrosive reasons as opposed to health reasons. Um, does, that, does that make sense to you? So yeah. the question of, of the, the, the 15 is actually better directed to the much more well-educated and familiar yeah. um, Brian Redmond. Speaking to, to the one, the Department of Health, and this question was asked earlier, that we have, the Department of Health has, um, let me, I, I, I will send you this document. Um, we have uh, Vermont Health Advisors and Vermont Action Levels. And those are for some of those, um, so these are calculations that are done by Department of Health staff by looking at epidemiology and toxicology and determining health-based levels. So in the case of, of 15, I think we all agree 15 is not a health-based level, so we would look at what, are, what does the epidemiology and toxicology show us, and what is that, and we, and we, and we follow that, we follow the science down, down the road, and it, it gives us what it gives us. So in the case of lead, the answer is, is one. But it is, as, as the, the distinguished member from CLF mentioned, that that is not an enforceable standard. And the, the Vermont health advisories become enforceable when they are adopted by DEC into one of their uh, many rules. Okay, you just mentioned CDC. No, D, sorry, D, DEC. DEC. Yes. Okay. CDC does not have rules. C, CDC does not have a. Have no, they are they are they are an anarchic group. No, um, <laughs> they don't. They don't. Impact, they don't. They're not. They're not a regular. They're not in, in this area. They are. They're not a regulatory body. Okay. At, just at the federal level. Yes. Not looking at natural resources, but looking at health. There is no guideline health-wise that from the federal government. There's just the, I don't know what the FDA, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> Co correct. There's no, fed there is no federal guidance as to a, as a, as to a health base yeah. level. They don't do, a, well, I should say, yeah. there, there are some guidance documents. The Department of Health. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the Department of Health does its own calculations. Yeah. Um, Department of Health. Department, Department of Health. The Vermont Department of Health does okay. its own calculations with regard to toxins, toxicants, and other contaminants in the environment um, that have potential health effects. Professor James. Um, I'm still back on the health advisory. I was just looking at your website. Yes. A, a health advisory is what the lowest level of alert, and then it looked like there was a health alert. I, I'm just trying to understand what a health advisory actually is supposed to indicate to the public. Sure. So the advisory, so I don't want to I don't want to bore the committee. A health <laughs> advisory reflects the consideration of public health concerns and analytic laboratories reporting limits. The a health advisory considers ingestion for exposure for all chemicals as well as potential exposure via inhalation of vapors in the case of air due to household use for an, uh, so the driver if a health advisor is exceeded, it does not necessarily follow that the health effects may occur, but exposure should be minimized while further evaluation of the water supply is conducted. And, and I'll send this document to you so you can have this all written out. Thank you me. can't memorize that as I read it too quickly. That was no, fast. For the education committee, we actually read those documents. Of course. <laughs> with, with, I, assume, I assume with highlighters, so. With highlighters, yes, absolutely. Representative Elder. I'm just curious, do you know has, um, it sounds like there's a certain amount of testing that just happens to the 15 parts per billion for municipal water systems, et cetera. Um, has any 
it has any broad based testing as is envisioned in S40 happened in Vermont ever to a standard, be it three parts per billion or one, and I hear that we just heard testimony asking for a lower standard. Just wondering if that's, if the Department of Health has ever done that, has ever, uh, have we done this to state buildings, have we done this to this building, or have we, do we have a comparable study to look at? So the, 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 pilot, is, the pilot is what we have, we have the testing of the municipal water system that the DEC does, and we have the testing that's done by child care facilities and, day, and daycare. So there are, there are home-based child care and there are licensed child care facilities. So we do have all the results from, from the testing that they do in order to be licensed. And to get their license, they've got to be under 50? Yes. So they're not, you, you don't have any data for the child care centers that would necessarily get this three parts per billion? We do because we have, we, we actually have the, we do have, we have the actual results from what they got. So whether it be one or whether it be 16, we actually have those results. Have you gotten a sense on a percentage basis uh, how many of those would fail if their action level was three? Yes. And if you give me a moment, All right. I'll vamp while I try and find the email. <laughs> um, I was actually just looking at this, at this chart yesterday. I could talk about something else while my computer slowly yeah, searches the, the through pilots, each. The pilots, the pilots. Yes, the pilot. Where, where is the pilot study? Could, could we where, is, where is the report? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can, I'm happy to provide you with a copy. Yeah, and that's going to show the different schools that were tested and what the results the, were? The schools, the levels, what they did, and, and, and the costs associated. And, and that they reported in, in parts per billion? Parts right. per billion. Okay, because some places I see that it's, you know, uh, megagrams per liter or something. And so then what, you, you I, have to speak to a I scientist. Don't remember my, that math. my understanding is it's the, it's the same thing. Yes. What is the same thing? Parts per billion? Parts per billion and mi micrograms. Micrograms Mic per liter. It's actually the that's same thing. That's the same thing. thing. Yeah. Okay. So if I say two mic if I see two micrograms per liter, that's the same as I mean, there's like there's a conversion that you have to do and that's part of the reasoning behind the the, the the need for a good clear database because the way it comes out of the lab, the conversion needs to happen for the public to understand. Okay. But point one five micrograms per liter is fifteen parts per billion. Fifteen parts, okay. Thank you. So I now have those numbers. Okay. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm happy to send this to you as well. So I'm just going to read this out loud. I'll do so in a slower fashion. Results for 486 home-based child care that were collected first draw samples. Um, well, I, I can just send this to you. So uh, greater than 1 PP, PBB was 15%. Greater than 3 was 4.5%. Greater than 5 was 2.8%. And greater than... 15 was 1%. Okay. 1%? Percent. 1%. One percent, so, that's five, so that's five homes were above 15. Of um, the 486 that were tested? Correct. 73 homes were below 1. Okay. 22 homes were below 3. So you're talking about 19. So if the, so if it were, if the level were set, we're just speaking theoretically, if the level were set at 3, 19 homes out of the 486 would fail. Okay. And at 1? And, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> I don't think I can do the math. 70 to 75. 70. 15 well, percent of 486, right? Yeah. 70 to 75. I, I'm seeing, the DEC might have an answer. Yeah. Uh, just, just for the record, uh, Brian Redmond, Director for Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. Uh, one point of clarification with this data is that they are one liter samples. Mm -hmm. um, so they are, okay. it is a different sample volume than what's contemplated under S40. Okay. Uh, and actually, while I have your attention, I have a little bit of additional data that I can share and I'll provide this with the committee. Um, monitoring from our public water systems, which are schools, uh, again, one liter samples and not all outlets. Um, we've collected 1,799 samples. 1.9% um, of those, and this is, sorry to back up in the last three years, 1.9 um, of those were over the action level of 15 parts per billion, 6.4 of those over 5 parts per billion, um, and 29.2 over 1 part per billion. Okay. 
and I'll provide this information uh, to you. the committee. Thank you very much. So just in terms of the one leader test, in comparison to the test that we're talking about in the, in the, in the bill, so just in terms of you know, reliability and validity of some of these, these tests and the comparison, you're going into someone's home, is it possible they could have run the pipes for you know half an hour before anybody tested it? It, it is possible, yes. Yeah. So there, there is a, a, the, a they, factor. They are, they, are, they are necessarily adhering to the, to the, to the three to the three T's. Right. Okay. I, I do. If I can yeah. make a point, I, I would say somewhat parenthetically. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about the three T's, and I don't think it, has, it hasn't been updated. Is it 2006? I think so. So the Department of Health is reviewing that now, and is and because the. The bill allows the Department of Health to adopt a protocol that is no, that is more strict than the three T's, and we are looking at yeah. those provisions carefully now because we do feel like they are that some of those provisions are outdated. Okay, and the provisions that are in this bill are the three T's. Are the three T's, but allows the Department of Health to adopt a protocol that is more uh -huh. that is not less stringent. Than okay, so three you're not T's. locked to that level. You, but you, by rule, you'll be able to. Well, even our interim protocol, yeah. the protocol or the rule, will be able to, and I'm, and I'm just informing yeah. the committee that it will likely be more stringent, more stringent okay. than what is contained in 3Ts. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Again, for Please. the record, uh, Brian Redman, uh, one point of clarification, the 3Ts was updated this past fall. Oh, okay. So there is a brand new version available. Thank you, Brian. And it's still 15 in the, in the new version. The original uh, three T's uh, that I, I believe was referenced earlier, um, I'm not familiar with the language that Elena had um, testified to, but uh, the standard in three T's, and this is why you see it in some of the state programs that are out there in the country, was 20 parts per billion. Uh, the reissuance, and I think the basis for the 20 parts per billion is the, the SAMP extrapolating off the 15 parts per billion, which is the federal action level. Uh, and then extrapolating out for sample size is the basis for that number. Um, the reissuance of the three T's, they now left that discretionary up to the states. Okay. I never, never trouble anyone anyway without Brian because he has the information. <laughs> Madam, may I also uh, make a point of clarification? Is that yes, okay? for the record, for you name Elena name. Mahali, again, Conservation Law Foundation. Um, you had asked if there was a federal standard, health-based standard for lead. And there is. So EPA sets first what's called an MCLG, which is a maximum contaminant limit level goal. That is the place where they take into account epidemiology and toxicology and health alone. That for lead is zero parts per billion. Now, then they take into consideration technical feasibility and costs on the water system. And that's how they get the M's and MCL. Okay, so but, this is tying to what Michael O'Grady was was talking about a little earlier in terms of, of them not. Well, and to further clarify, this is not enforceable. The G is not an enforceable standard. Correct. The goal. The, the goal. The goal yeah. is we're headed this way. Okay. You said aspiration. Billion. Billion. Other questions. So just to clarify, they would agree with O'Grady's assessment that they're not conflicting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, you would agree? And CLF would CLF agree? CLF would agree. Okay. And DEC would agree? Agree to what? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. That the action levels on the federal level versus the state would be? The, the, the MCLG, right? Right. Yeah. MCLG, according to EPA, for lead is zero. Yeah. The action level is 15 parts per billion. The Vermont Health Advisory is established at one part per billion, which the reason why it's one is because that is the level that you can detect lead in a water sample. It's like essentially equivalent to zero. Is the, detec the detection level. The detection level. Yeah. Whose point was he was okay? I think he was talking, were you asking oh, if, yeah. if, if you would agree that this is not an appeal by, right. by implication? That's, that's, exactly. I think that's the question. That's what I meant. That's right. Thank you. Um, I, I would want to take a closer look if that is the case. That would. Um, I, I would hope that would be the case. Uh, right. I don't have a position. On so you hope you agree? Yes. Okay. And you agree? 
I agree. Okay. Representative Elder. Thank you. Can I ask you a question about the pilot project results that you is that you can ask numbers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll see yeah. if I can we ask. might even have you come back and, and yeah. I would be the pilot. Nothing. I, I yeah. think this will be quick ish. Yeah. So like the very simple life. <laughs> so it's a relatively small group of school. Um, I'm just sca just scanning the data. Richford Elementary School. I'm not trying to pick on them, but it certainly jumps out mm -hmm. um, because there's a total of 26 TAPs. At first, they had 15 of them were over 15 parts per billion, right? So that's high. And then I'm just noticing that their first draw sample. What we heard from um, Dr. Costanza yesterday is that. Typically, especially if it's a fixture issue, we're expecting the first draw to be higher and then a flush sample to be lower. In Richford's case, that doesn't really happen. In fact, they're kind of uh, below one part per billion. They actually get fewer samples that get below, you know. On the, so I'm just wondering, that would just seem of all this data to jump out and say, huh, maybe Richford's got a problem other than the fixtures that we think are the most common cause. Yes. Maybe they have an issue upstream in a water tank. Maybe they have lead solder in their pipes. How are we going to handle that? And is there going to be any? Because I, I see in the bill that the Department of Health is responsible for coming up with the remediation plans for these schools. I'm just saying, is there going to be some differentiation well, based on that kind of data? So that's a great question. So the the Department of Health actually won't be coming up with remediation plans. We'll be coming up with guidance. The schools have to have to come up with remediation plans with the assistance of the capable. DEC and they'll submit those remediation plans. We won't I do it see. for them. So it's we're only getting see. one person, and we, we have right. at last count 1,550 facilities with whom we must, from whom we will get tests. 1,550. Okay. There were, oh, I, uh, one uh, one minor technical yes. point, which is that right now the, the exemption, and I'm afraid I don't have it. Somewhere around here, um, <laughs> there was uh, there's an exemption for schools that have that, that for schools schools that have tested right. within one year. Yeah. Um, right. That actually doesn't cover the pilot period. Okay. So the department would recommend that that date be moved back to um, October of 2017. Okay. I believe that that schools started testing in November, so so October of 2017 would actually cover. Them. But right now, the, but the one year preceding. Just, just just January 2019 would not cover any of the pilot schools or or, or, or other schools who were testing it during that time period. Okay, so what, when were they testing? What was the date then? So that so the pilot schools started testing in November of 2017. Okay, but we, we might get you back to talk to us about okay, that. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, can I can I make one yeah, quick point, which please. is in representative Elder, I don't want to. You, you raised a question yesterday, but and I, yeah. you know, and I, and I, by the way, I, I pray the, the committee's forbearance. I had to run down to the Senate and talk about something else. Oh, it's um, always them. Right? Yeah. Such, don't tell them I, I told this, but it's nothing but trouble. <laughs> um, you, asked, you asked a question about, um, Representative Elder, you asked a question about, um, about the actual testing and how that was actually done and in terms of like the, the movement of, of samples. Yeah. So the Department of Health, will actually, con in, in consultation with AOE and DEC, we actually do one-on-one -on -one contact with schools. We do the training, we provide, uh, we provide written materials, and we, and we give that, we give the, the schools, and, and now the, um, under the bill, the um, <coughs> daycare centers um, and, and uh, home-based child care centers, uh, child care providers, I should say, um, we actually give them the, you know, the, bo like the bottles and the box and the ship. So we will actually, we, the Department of Health will actually, and we'll also do the testing. So we will actually handle all the logistics, just not the actual testing itself inside the four walls of the, of the entity. So, we're not, so people aren't going to be looking like for a box and peanuts and you know, shipping labels. We'll actually we'll do all that. Mm -hmm. I am sure we, were going to be, we will be speaking to you again. I just I, delighted. We're fun. <laughs> we're a fun committee. <laughs> Um, I was going to get Stephanie up. I, I have you you here. Um, you're willing to just hang with us for a little longer. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Stephanie. Environmental conservation. Yeah. Under. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. 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 Um, for the record, I'm Stephanie Barron from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, and let's see how that looks. So I've been the drafter of the fiscal note. Um, it goes with S40 as it passed out of the Senate. <laughs> um, and you can see it's at the top, it says version four, because it was a bit of a constant work in progress to get up to speed as right. the Senate Ed Committee went through its <laughs> deliberations. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the, the governor's proposal and the budget adjustment. Um, so this, um, just to step back for a moment, the actual appropriation as it came out of the Senate was in H97, the budget adjustment bill, for a total for all portions related to S40 of $2.5 million, $2.5 million, $25,000 um, was the total. Um, all of that is going to the health department except for $125,000, which would be additional resource in DEC. Um, and so, um, okay, yeah. um, the, the fiscal note um, initially started with just the initial testing cost estimate, um, then understanding the administrative ask that was included in that, and then um, adding the estimate for the child care centers, both the homes and the center based care and the retesting cost, and an estimate for the, what I'll call initial remediation, the TAP uh, only remediation. There is no estimate in this for remediation above, uh, beyond that, and that's, it, there's just not a way to come up with a reasonable estimate of what that cost will be. It's a um, question mark and um, fiscal reality that you'll have to face when, um, when you know what the scope and depth of those potentially are. Um, so the, um, I, I don't know if folks have it on there. I, I want to sort of walk through um, you know, something that you can read. But the total administrative cost is $400,000. There's 125 for the position in DEC, 125 for a position in uh, health department, and about $150,000 for data management and the initial startup costs for the project. And one other point, this, this $2.525 million is envisioned as one time, not as ongoing um, support from the state for a, an ongoing initiative. Um, the, um, I've attached in this um, fiscal note sort of my, my worksheets, um, which may not be the easiest thing to follow, but, um, the, the initial testing costs, um, so that's uh, you, you, the 400 that I just talked about at the very top of that page. The initial testing costs are pretty straightforward. And, uh, they're just based on the, um, I'm gonna, I don't mean to make anyone nauseous, but um, they're just based on the number of buildings we know about, the estimated number of taps, um, the cost per test. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, and the, um, it, the you can see that the building count and the tap count included there, um, and the estimated cost. So of the of the initial testing cost up here, which is just under 1.1 million dollars, I have 850 thousand dollars of that on the school side, which have a lot more taps than on the child care side, where the centers have, you know, some taps and the other homes have. Um, it, my estimate was three taps per home. Um, so that it, it, those were the sort of pieces that came together and were the easier pieces to, to estimate. Um, and then the question of retesting and remediation. Um, and in that, I relied on, um, I'm going to switch back down here again, um, the data that was able to be sort of put together from the pilot, from the information from DEC. Um, uh, Dr. Robinson could stand it, sort of gave some uh, percentages of failure rates related to Addison Central. Um, once we had the pilot information and the school specific information from DEC, the lower end of the potential failure rate, um, even though the sample is t uh, the sample size, the sample methodology is different than what's proposed, what gave us a comfort level with estimating the remediation um, 
and the retesting costs. So that's the basis for uh, those cost estimates. Um, and so the, the, the retesting cost has, um, the one thing that changed when the bill got into Senate appropriations is we had initially, I had initially um, thought that a $300 tap um, remediation cost was, was what um, would work. But in thinking about the child care centers, the schools have the capacity to um, do like the, the, actually change out the tap as opposed to just pay for the, the fixture itself. And um, so the, the thinking was that on the child care centers, the, the tap remediation cost should actually include labor. So that was doubled to 600 for the child care centers. And that was a change that went from Senate Ed to Senate Appropriations. Um, so the, the retesting cost based on, um, and I've averaged a one in a five part per billion to, to estimate the three part per billion that's in the Senate bill. So the, the retesting cost is just under $190,000, that $188,000, where I'm averaging the two. And then the, um, this, uh, the school portion of tap replacement is $560,000. And the child care portion is just about $300,000, that $296,000. I'm sorry, it's, a, it's not very well laid out for you to follow through. It's just me putting all my notes together so I can <laughs> repeat them to folks. So that's the source of the estimate that was the amount of money appropriated in H97, um, which was the, is the budget adjustment. Um, so that, I understand that the House budget adjustment will pull that appropriation out and it could be placed back in as 40. Um, that, that's still a uh, football. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> But that's, I, I'll stop there and let folks ask questions. <laughs> but it does not include anything beyond a tap remediation estimate. It doesn't. I understand that I think there are 200 in federal funds somewhere. Um, Do you hear anything about that now? I don't have any federal funds. This is, this is purely estimated as a general fund cost yeah. for these particular pieces. Um, OK. I, I thought there was 200 in federal funds, but at 200,000 federal funds. Oh. See, this is why we need you here. <laughs> Brian. Uh, yeah. For the record, Brian Redmond, that, those are EPA funds specific to the testing costs. Okay. Uh, we've filed a letter of intent of interest for the funds, okay. and uh, we're not anticipating the grant award to occur till sometime in August. Okay. And that would be earmarked for this particular job if it comes through? We should know more in the next two months in okay. terms of the amount and the likelihood of us receiving. The okay. shutdown pushed the schedule back a little bit. Okay. Questions? Clarifying question? Yes, please. The, um, at the bottom, where, I think it was the bottom where you were just showing the difference between the pilot project um, oh, percentages this, this, and failure. Yeah, this, yeah, 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 there you go. So the Addison Central, I was trying to remember, was the method, I know the pilot project was one liter samples. Was the Addison Central, do you know that methodology was more consistent with what S40 would require, as in quarter liter samples? I, I, I don't know. I think, I think Brian. So just to, just to clarify, for the pilot project, we used 250 milliliter samples, and the standard that we used was also 15 parts per billion with the aspirational goal of going as low as you can of one part per billion. So the we didn't have any authority in the pilot. Uh, so we set a standard and, and held the schools to the 15 with the goal of going as low as we possibly could. That's how the pilot was run. What did we heard about the one liter sample size? That's what um, is the sampling size under the federal lead and copper rule. Okay. Uh, so that is the collection that uh, the child care facilities are currently doing under DCF regulations. They're complying with the requirements of the water supply rule as well as the public water suppliers, um, which include a subset of schools. 150 schools are regulated as public water systems. Okay. I guess what I was just trying to tease out is, is there a real difference in methodology between that Addison Central and that BDH pilot? Just because those numbers are so different and they establish a really big range that really is going to yeah. have a big effect in what you're extrapolating yeah. for and so, so I, in the cost estimate, I relied on the BDH pilot, which is sample sized, like okay. that, and the schools from the community portion that the 
15 to 18, about um, uh, 1,800 samples. That, that was the, the data that Brian had verbally given you a few minutes yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, that is a different sample size. But, I, okay. but those, those were confirming each other, um, and that was it was amazing. The, you didn't it, draw your assumptions off this per, no. as left column at all. It, but it was a piece of testimony that was when I was first following this that was given. Thank you. Um, so that's because <laughs> yeah. I did actually put out one version of this that was much higher based on those higher percentages of failure. Yeah. That was a little hard stopping for some people. <laughs> yeah, right. That would be yeah. a little bit better. Other questions for Stephanie? <coughs> so basically 2.5 million thereabouts plus or minus on a, using one-time money. Yes. This was in the BAA and we're trying to figure that yeah. out. And the positions, the, the two positions that would be funded are actually created in S40. Yes. Usually you think the money and the positions go together, but they kind of are, you know, <laughs> different boats at the moment. <laughs> so 2.5 million in one-time money at the three, and I'm, I'm sorry if and I missed. That's the three, that is at the three parts per billion. Yeah, I'm sorry yeah. if I missed. What would the one-time cost be at the one? Um, I can get that for you. It should be pretty. Um, the, the testing cost, the, um, the, the testing cost, and the admin cost wouldn't change, but the retesting and the remediation would change. Um, and so, and it would, uh, so the testing cost would go up um, close to double, I get, I get, or actually double, because it's, um, I'll, I'll actually Thank send you, you a note on it, just so I don't do it, you know. That'd but, be great. Um, that's what I can, I can send you. <clears throat> Or as someone said to us, they don't do public math. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is really simple. <laughs> yeah, it's in the last one. The faucets that you're, you uh, scoped out, or, um, what, can you describe them? So that was, I, it, it, yeah. <laughs> um, that was based on just an estimated, not, so there, there was a lot of conversation about do you, you know, if you are changing out a tap or like a, you know, like a water fountain, do you go to something that's like an 800 necessarily encourage a, a increased spending? Mm -hmm. um, so this was at the 50% was at that 300. Um, I know I know that um, you know there's <coughs> the tax themselves, the replacement piece of the fixtures. I don't know if there's a list of what is actually lead free, um, but that's I know that's something that um, they'll have to. You, know, you don't want to replace something that actually has lead it with lead in it. Yeah. Well, that's that a struggle. Unfortunately, I've heard that that technology doesn't but, exist. So. But it doesn't assume an upgrade. And the you know remediation that would involve something much more um, involved construction-wise. That's a whole you know you get into all sorts of questions about what other you know once you start opening walls and things, what other sort of upgrades might you be you know there's it becomes a, a much more complicated question about you know, shares and things like that. Would we get recommendations from like some like from you in terms of what faucet at you know a reasonable price would make sense? <coughs> I because we were talking about filters, right? You know, faucets with a certain filter. Yes. Uh, you, Brian, for the record, Brian Redmond. So this, I, I hate to commit to that now. This is a whole new area of jurisdiction for us. We are not plumbing people. <laughs> um, and so we would be able to provide recommendations for filters. Those would be the uh, NSF ANSI certified units mm -hmm. um, if the filter route was chosen. Again, there's some concerns around the filter route. I think they're proven very effective, but um, there's a, a financial cost to them, a time cost to them, and then the key is that they need to be properly operated and maintained. Um, or as Dr. Costanza Robinson said yesterday, you may be trading one problem for another. Um, but in terms of faucets, we, I, I haven't done the research, but we, we would likely um, sort of start specking uh, what is considered lead-free faucets and, and digging into that research. I did speak with the engineers who were in here yesterday, and they, they, they may be able to provide us some information on that as well. I've asked them to look into it. Any other questions then for Stephanie? 
I think we're, that's, yeah, that's it for now. Did, yeah. you know, obviously, it's, a, it's an estimate, so it right? could turn out that you are here next year being asked for a bit more money, or it could they could come back and say it didn't cost as much. <laughs> and, oh, wouldn't that be nice? So, <laughs> we've, been known to, we've been known for that to happen. What has happened? Okay, thank you. Um, David, as long as you're here, did you want to <coughs> add anything to what's been said? Um, the pressure actually is off for us to, us to get this done. I've spoken with um, with our leadership, and she actually saw it as an after crossover bill. So we have a little bit more flexibility in terms of timing than, than I was hearing after the senators were here. So um, we will have a little bit more time. This is this is actually fairly significant, particularly in line with some of the other requests before us. Anything else? Just in, yeah. just in terms of the request for um, delays, I'm just wondering again, I think we're not You're talking about uh, the, the other. The data delays, the, uh, there's another delay we were asked for, or oh, the proficiency. You know, we, it seems yeah. like we have like three or four we requests. Do. We do. And I think this morning hearing from, um, you know, the BPA and the um, school Board Association, the Principals Association, it was a request not to add one more thing. So I'm just wondering if this is a high priority, can we <coughs> lighten up on something else that might not be so health related? We have some things that we have to get through before crossover. This is not one of them. 40 is not something that we have to complete before crossover. The Senate wants us to complete it now, but the House does not, it's not a requirement. Um, the the one about the Green Mountain College though that is does need to get done before crossover. Um, there are a couple of other little things I know that just sort of hanging around here that that um, we've been discussing that we do need to address. But S40 is not one that we need to complete before crossover. One seventy three. I, I, the crossover, I, I don't really understand. So could it be after crossover and you can say you have one more year in terms of implementation and now you need to do this? We, we can, we can um, talk about that. We actually okay. are, are prepared to talk about that. Okay. Um, yes, we are. We, we need to kind of get together our list of, of things. And I can tell you, I think I can tell you, I've um, pulled together some things. Um, we have the independent colleges concern. We have, um, I know that uh, the agency has a bunch of uh, what they would call technical changes that they'd like to make. Um, we have uh, the request of the, uh, uh, the, the VASBO for a two year delay, which we need to sort out. Um, we have radon. Um, we have the budget that Peter's not here, but we're looking at the budget. Um, then tomorrow we're, we're dealing with a concern around adult um, adult education and high school completion. That's interesting. So we can also have an equalized pupils. Yes, time. and we have um, our school uh, tax rates. So and you're working on that, right? It's going to be whenever we're done the budget discussion time? Yes, yes, great. Start so budget. budget, we have budget that we're talking about tomorrow, right? We yeah, so if we can get the done the budget presentation before 3.30, yeah. then Brad is available. Okay, good. 